Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Every Rocky Ever, a Colorado Rockies podcast, part of the Rocky Mountain Rooftop Network, under the Fans First Sports Network. I'm your host, Skyler Timmons, joined always here by my older brother, Dustin. Hello, hello. Wearing his county cappies hat. The cappy oh, yeah, because this is vintage now because they don't exist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's true. He shipped them off to Las Vegas. I thought they were going to Oakland. <laughs> yeah. Can't hey, that'd be a good big league team. Or you can, you should sell it off and then create the uh create a minor league team there in Pueblo County. Hmm. I don't know why they never have. You know, it's it'd be a good place for a it's a good baseball town. Mm-hmm. Babe Ruth played here. Mm -hmm. In an exhibition game. There you go. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. No. Could be possible. You just got to get really rich or crowdsource it. Something. But uh, we got to, we're figuring out what we wanted to do for this episode. And uh, kind of topical. It's been on our minds with the Rockies in 2024 who have a, for lack of a better term, an awful bullpen. And a big problem is it, part of it is, they don't have a closer. And the closers have, have become a very premium thing in, in MLB these days. You need somebody who can come in and close things out with the game on the line, secure a win, and preserve a lead. And they just don't have that this year. So, it's been rough. It, yeah. Well, when you look at the history of the Rockies, that's always been an issue. They'll get a few good years out of a guy and then, then they're gone. The Rockies have never had like a San Diego Padres with, with Trevor Hoffman Yankees with Mariano Rivera. Like they've gone through these stretches of, well, let's see who's, who mm -hmm. we can throw in there. And yeah, we've had, we've had some guys that, that popped up a little more than usual, but it wasn't a long lasting career. It was mm -hmm. kind of the flash in the pan for a couple seasons and then it was over. But especially in this year of 2024, it, 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 you never know. Mm -hmm. You never know who's going to go and how many times have they blown a lead in the ninth when you don't have that guy that can just go in lights out, shut the door. You yeah. Know, uh, was it a Mason Miller from Oakland mm -hmm. or anybody that will just go and the, the thing I, I, I look at the list of our, our closers. Where's that guy that would just go blow it past people at a hundred, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, go in where you see him running out of the bullpen and you're like, Oh man, it's it's done. Mm. Like the rock, it's like I I feel it's like the clown car pulling up to the circus. Mm. You know, we're gonna see which one's the last one out of the car. Mm -hmm. And but these these three guys that we'll talk about today, uh, they didn't last all for you know ten years. It was usually in the closest, maybe three years, mm -hmm. four years for these guys. But uh, these three, we thought we'd they'd be good to to hit on about the closer situation for the Rockies. Yeah, because it's a, as we said it's a premium position. It's a tough job to fill because you got to just have a certain mentality and mentality and arsenal to be able to take over in that spot. And I think these three are not your maybe your prototypical starters or or closers, but they still. Fill some of the, check some of those boxes are like, yeah, bottom of the ninth. I'll take these guys. They'll they'll keep us in it, especially for some of those seasons that we talk about. So the three that we are going to talk about: one Houston Street, Rafael Betancourt, and Jose Jimenez. Three guys that really are some of the best closers in not just closers but relievers 
in Rockies history for those years they spent as closers. So it should be fun ones to talk about. And we'll kick things off here with one Houston Street. And uh, Dustin, I'll hand off to you. Tell us about old Houston Street. Houston Street, that right-handed. Uh, he always seemed like a, a smaller guy mm-hmm. um, up on the mount, but he's six foot. Um, from Austin, Texas, he was drafted by the o- Oakland Athletics in the first round of the 2004 draft um, out of the University of Texas. Yeah, he ended up being Rookie of the Year for uh, for Oakland in 2005 when he made his debut and he was a two-time all-star in his career um like i said he started out in oakland and then came over to the rockies in 2009 when well in november of 2008 when the rockies made that big trade to oakland uh rocky shipping matt holiday who they just were not going to be able to re-sign um, and they picked up Carlos Gonzalez and Greg Smith and for Houston and along with Houston Street. And I, th- I think we got the better half of that. We got the better end of that deal. Yeah. Uh, you know, Carlos Gonzalez, you know, he's one of my all-time favorite Rockies. And, you know, Houston Street inserted into the lineup in that closer role and had a lot of success. Greg Smith, not so much. He but, appeared in eight games. <laughs> ooh, and they were not good. Um, so he stays with the Rockies until they trade him in December of 2011, and they sent him to the Padres for a player to be named. That player would end up being Nick Schmidt, and he didn't really do anything for the Rockies. Um, after that, he played in San Diego until he was traded to the Angels. And then uh, towards the end of his career, injuries started to stack up and he was done playing professionally in 2017. Mm-hmm. And that was that was his his career number 16 and you know, pretty successful. 324 career saves mm-hmm. um, in his in his whole major league career. Yeah. It's too shabby, and he was just on the Hall of Fame ballot in the 2023 cycle, and uh, I believe he fell off, or he was dropped off the ballot. Not sure how many votes he got, but I guess relievers and closers kind of have a hard time on the Hall of Fame ballot, but the fact that he was even considered on it is still a, a huge honor. You know, it's in, you look at, when you think of great MLB closers. I don't know how many people are thinking of Houston street from 2005 to 2017 or 2005 to 2015. Especially with the Rockies. Like sometimes I, I just, when we were doing our research stuff and I kept thinking like, man, Houston street. Oh yeah. (laughs) Like that. Mm -hmm. It was, it was kind of a weird window of, you know, we went from the Brian Fuentes, uh, Manny Corpus, and then Houston Street comes and takes that spot. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the Rockies in those years were de- de- decent. Not that great. Um, but he was a guy, you know, closing up ball games and ended up with, what, 84? Uh, 84 saves for the Rockies in those three years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think the, the big thing... For him, as we'll we'll get into his stats here real quick. So he was a huge part of that 2009 season. Rocky, the arguably the best team in Rockies history. They won the what 92 games, something like that. I always forget, but they go to the playoffs, second time in three years. So this was a nice spot of them building up this young corn. They have this anchor at the back of the back of the bullpen. Guy who'd been a rookie of the year had had success out there in Oakland. He was at a 1.72 in 2005, 3.31 ERA in 2006, 2.88 in 2007. Jumped up a little high, 3.73 in 2008. But still, throwing 70 innings, he's come in, doesn't, wasn't walking a ton of guys. Maybe a little more than you'd want out of your 
reliever at the back end of the bullpen, a closer, but could get punch outs. He wasn't an overpowering guy, but his repertoire and just the way he went about pitching was just so effective coming out of the back of the bullpen. And that's why in 2009, he puts up 35 saves for that team, which is huge. Yeah, if, if only he, if only that success would have rolled into the playoffs because he yeah. struggled in those <laughs> playoffs. Yeah. <laughs> so in, in 2009, Rockies go to the playoffs. They face off against the Phillies again and struggled. He pitched three games, just two and two thirds innings, gives up four runs on six hits. The issue was walks, three walks, one strikeout. And he was 0-2, so he lost two of those games. And I I think I remember it was... Our story for this one is it was the... I think the last game of that series or the winner go home for the Rockies. And I think we went to go to our brother's choir concert (laughs) at the high school. And we're listening to it in the car. And we get there and then we go inside. And... I think you had tried to bring your computer in. You think I think you brought a laptop in to connect to the school Wi-Fi, and we're sitting in the back there, and you're watching the game, the old game day feed that they used to have, <laughs> and we're sitting there, and while our brother's choir concert's going on, we're kind of sitting there just eyeballing the the game day updates. Oh man, those are the days. No Rockies TV then. And then uh, I think afterwards is like during the intermission or like after the thing. <laughs> We'd figured out how oh, the Rockies lost and shut the computer and a lady in front of us. Was like what happened? Like the Rockies lost. She's like, oh, darn. Like, no. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh. But it, he struggled. Houston Street struggled quite a bit with with injury, you know, shoulder soreness, tricep. Uh, he got drilled by a by a line drive in batting practice. Mm. And so, so that was always the things. But he was, like I said, he, he you know, he had a, a unique, uh, unique up. mechanics, his wind up. You know, as a closer, you're thinking a guy that's, like on the rubber, ready to go in the stretch, but he had the big, the long swooping, you know, step to the side and big leg kick and and go, and uh, that that was something that I, I was. His stats weren't too bad, but I just remember like, like we say, a lot of times we remember those bad moments, mm-hmm. and that kind of defines a lot of what you think or remember of him. Yeah. When (laughs) he was really good in the regular season for the most part. Now, especially pitching in Colorado where, you know, you kind of have to skew our perception of what's a good reliever or good closer. He had an ERA under four, all three years in Colorado, which pretty good. Now through at least 40 innings each year, had at least 20 saves each year. For 35 in 2009, 20 in 2010, 29 in 2011. So that three-year stretch, it's pretty good, though. That's a bunch of wins that you're securing because Houston Street's coming in the back end of the bullpen. And I said that the mechanics, I think, was the big thing and really helped build that, per, I guess, deception for him when he pitched because he wasn't a hard thrower. I think he's like averaging like 90 something about 90 on his fastball mm-hmm. so he's having to rely on the natural movement he can get from his arm slot where he's generating movement from there and you know, throwing that occasional wipeout slider just the two pitch mix and the deception of his movements and his arm slot and how he could make the ball move made him effective and found more success away from Coors Field where he became that two-time all-star with the Padres and you know, had ERAs under two after he left the Rockies and you know, gets a nice little payday with, from the Angels and then injuries kind of 
really get after him in 2016, 2017, that end his career at 33. But that three year stretch in Colorado, you were saying like, man, we wish that could have lasted a little longer. Maybe 2012 wouldn't have been as much of a dumpster <laughs> fire because we were able to have a little bit more stability in the back end of the bullpen. And then we could have traded him for something better instead of just some random minor leaguer that didn't do anything. But they wanted yeah, to. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was like we could have gotten something way better than that for Houston Street, but you know that's the business side of baseball. Yeah, and things. But you know, overall, that was his. Where is he at in Rockies all-time saves? Uh, in all-time saves, he places third all-time in career saves for the Rockies with eighty-four. He's behind Brian Fuentes at number one. We'll talk about number two later in this episode, but he sits in at number three, just ahead of Daniel Bard, who's at 61. See, and, and, and that's the thing. Daniel Bard could have got there if, you know, he had, you know, full healthy mm-hmm. seasons and consistent seasons. Yeah. But, and, you know, in that, in those stretches, you know, with Houston Street, those three years, solid. Yeah. And in terms of pitching, in win probability added, according to uh, baseball reference. So this is kind of like war in the sense where it's minute details. If you're not super uh, knowledgeable about the stats, if you're listening to it, wins prob- win probability added. Every action in a baseball game either adds to you winning or adds to you losing. So strikeout, it would go down. Hit a home run, it goes up. There's value on every little thing you can do. And then so in total career uh, win probability added, Houston Street is third among all pitchers with a 4.6 win probability added. And that's behind Brian Fuentes at number one and Ubaldo Jimenez at number two. So two of your, uh, there's a lot of relievers on this list too, because they have the most impact depending on situations they come in, you know how big of a moment it is and impact on the game saves and big strikeouts and clutch situations. Houston streets right up there at number three. So the, he actively made the Rockies improve the Rockies chances of winning every time he took the mound. Aside from one pitch, aside from a couple pitches in the the playoffs. Yep. But that's, uh, that was him. I wish we could have, Maybe had some more, but, you know, he went on to San Diego, replaced Heath Bell and had, you know, a couple of good years. But then, sadly, the, the injuries just took over and and uh, he was done. Mm-hmm. And before we close out, one last thing that I remember, and I was telling you, I just remember the one video. They're in New York and he's on his way to like the fan. Cave. It was a fan cave video. They had some guy with him and he's wearing his jersey walk in the streets of New York and they're asking people, how do we get to Houston street? Where's Houston street? Cause there's Houston street <laughs> in, in New York, H O U S T O N and his is H U S T O N. And so he's sitting there wearing his Rockies Jersey and there's as people, where's Houston street? Like, Oh, it's over this way. And, uh, a very dumb video that MLB did back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Houston Street, one of the best, one of the best relievers. I'd say a really underrated reliever in baseball history. A good solid 10 years where he was dominant and then injuries kind of sapped him for the last two, but really solid. A career 2.95 ERA with 324 saves over 680 innings as a reliever. Pretty solid. Pretty solid. Not too bad. And then, uh, you know, his post-baseball career, I know he he was a a student coach uh, for the University of Texas for, you know, a season or two uh, when him and Troy Tulowitzki were there together uh, (laughs) coaching. But I think he's being, you know, being dad to his boys. Yeah. But uh, 
Moving on from Houston Street here, uh, our next closer, often called a human rain delay <laughs> because of how slow he was on the mound, but a very distinct uh, leg kick wind up out of the stretch that uh, really made him a solid closer who was really only the staple main closer for a couple of seasons. I thought he was way more, but still one of the best relievers. I'd say in Rocky's history, he was here for a good time. One old Raphael Betancourt. Oh, yeah. Number 63, right-handed reliever out of uh, Cumana, Venezuela. And, oh, man, Rafi is a good dude. Uh, he was uh, brought up into the, into the MLB through the Cleveland organization. Uh, made his debut in 2003. And played for Cleveland for seven seasons. And then he was brought over to the Rockies uh, in a trade in 2009. And the Rockies shipped off minor leaguer Connor Graham and got Rafael Betancourt, who had been, you know, a pretty decent, pretty decent reliever in, in his time at, in Cleveland. He's more of a setup guy, mm. and that's what he started out as with the Rockies, uh, is a, is that eighth inning, seventh, eighth inning guy getting ready for the, you know, getting ready for the closer. But Betancourt played for the Rockies from 2009 all the way to 2015, and he he was out of baseball in 2014 dealing with injury um, recovery, but. The you know in Colorado for six seasons for six years, and it was one of those you know after that year he he went into free agency signed with the Rockies in 2013 free agency signed back with the Rockies uh, he got free agency signed back with the Rockies mm -hmm. but then he was ultimately released by the Rockies in 2015 August 27 2015 uh, dealing with injury. Tommy and he John. just couldn't yeah and then there, there was a weird time where he he should have got tommy john but he went with the alternate you know the the alternate uh prp injections and stuff yeah and you know at, at the end it, it just couldn't couldn't make it back mm -hmm. uh, he did he did have some experience too in his career where he went over in two in in 2000 uh went and played in uh japan mm -hmm. just, yeah. just for a little bit yeah looking at his career transactions signed with the boston red sox in 1993 yep. as a amateur free agent then gets released in 1999 goes to japan to play his 2000 season <laughs> red sox are like oh come on back and then release him after the 2001 season when he becomes a free agent. So he doesn't make his debut until 2003, the age of 28, after he had signed with the Cleveland in Cleveland Indians at the time. And I will spend some good years there. So really interesting journey for him to get to the big leagues. And he sticks around till he's 40 at the major league level. And you know how the Rockies love their old men. <laughs> But he was he was solid, you know. Be, before before he 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 inherited the the closer role. Rafael Betancourt was that eighth inning guy. He was he would nail it down, you know. Something that was amazing in in his, you know, that I always thought of. They'd always talk about it. Is he didn't walk guys. He just didn't, hmm. he took forever to pitch. So the batter was probably asleep and you know, whatever. But, you know, in, in 2000, in 2010, you know, 2009, 25 innings, pretty solid. Only had five walks to 29 mm -hmm. strikeouts. The next year, 89 strikeouts to eight walks. 70 the next year 73 to eight walks and then 
after dealing with the injuries and stuff, yeah, his walks went up a little bit. But, man, what I would give, you know, that's what's always killed Rocky's pitching is walks. But mm-hmm. Rafael Betancourt was one like, work around the zone. Get mm-hmm. guys out. Yeah, and that, that was the thing that he was – he took forever to throw a stinking ball. <laughs> so they always called him the human rain delay because it was took forever when he took the mound. You're like, all right, settle in. This is going to take an hour. <laughs> Wake me up when Betancourt's done pitching. But it was always, again, not a huge, you know, overpowering guy. You know, 90, 94, somewhere in that range on his fastball. And then would throw that slider in there and things. But he just had that good movement. I just knew how to locate pitches, like you're saying, induce that weak contact, do what you needed to. Because you look at his ground ball rates, which is always good. good. In Colorado, you know, he was always a good ground ball pitcher, had a career around 30% ground ball rate. But in 2009, who was a deadline acquisition. So probably one of the best deadline trade deadline acquisitions for the Rockies pairing him nicely with with Houston Street setting him up at the age of 34 but a 28 percent goes up goes down to 26 percent then up to 30 percent ground ball rate 34 in 2012 his best year with the Rockies and then down to 33 in 2013 and then 2015 it goes to 22.8 but he didn't pitch very much that year but it's a solid dude would pound the zone, throw strikes, didn't give up a ton of home runs. You know, didn't really walk a lot of guys in Colorado. I think that was the one thing that really he benefited from. He improved that a good man, a couple of years, about three and a half percent walking dudes. And they would opponents couldn't hit him. Come in and just close it out, get some gra- get some grounders, wrap things up very nicely. Yeah, and he, it was he would you know his little wind up like he had the toe tap and then he he like he'd always be like messing with his hat like tug you you know all the time <laughs> all the time and it was I remember it's kind of like a like a more of, not so much like more of like the short arm yeah that you see a lot of guys today doing. It wasn't a big loopy arm arm movement. It was real short and boom, kind of like throwing darts. Yeah. So I'm looking up a video of him pitching here just so I can remember <laughs> what it looked like, but it took forever. And that, it reminded me of Alex Colomay a couple of years ago. Rockies, who took forever on the mound in between pitches. It, it's guys like them, why we have a pitch clock. But I always remember on his windup, the hitch with his knee, where the leg comes up parallel and then it kicks back again. So kind of like on a hinge, a two part leg goes up, kicks back, and then moves forward. Or it goes up and then it kicks up again. And then he would deliver that, or it'd go straight back and come forward, like you're saying on the kind of the BP throw step, but really effective and deceptive and hiding the ball. Well, just made him tough to hit. Good old Raffy. And he was one that, that, that I, I felt bad because it was, you know, everything good. And then his arm just went out and then it was never back to the same. Yeah. It was his last year when he came. He came back into the Rockies that last season. In uh, you know, in 2015, and he came back. It is like, oh, he looks. He looks like he did before, but he ended up going two and four with one save, a 6.18 ERA, and 45 appearances, and then the Rockies released him. Mm-hmm. And that was one that I'm like. It, I I hate it when when the the injury comes and the guys just can't 
get back to the way it was. Yeah. And sadly that, that was it for him. I was, I was, it, it was amazing too. Cause like you said, he was 40 years old and he's still grinding and you know, that was it. But after all said and done, his, his little, his little stint as Rocky's closer, he ended up pulling out 58 saves. That 2012 season, 31. For an 31 awful s- team. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for a terrible team. A 281 ERA. And you know, those years, pretty solid. So for the mm-hmm. Rockies, for his career, a, a, a 3.53 ERA, not bad at all. Yeah. And those saves place him seventh all time in franchise saves with 58, just behind Wade Davis and Bruce Ruffin, and just ahead of Darren Holmes. So he, he's up there, top 10 reliever. I'd say he's one of the best relievers in, in Rockies history, and all for a trade at the deadline in a competitive year managed to to pick up a solid reliever that they kept around for years because he liked pitching for him. They liked him. Uh, He was just a good, solid team dude. And I think part of, you know, the Rockies have had a great history of Venezuelan players. Yeah. And I think that, that, uh, that connection that they have, there was Carlos Gonzalez, Johnny Herrera there for a little bit. Uh, you know, you had, uh, Betancourt, uh, trying to think of who else came in at that time. Was Marquez, had he arrived then yet? No. But there, you know, there was, there was a, a few guys that they connect in the cultural aspect. And heck, having the grandpa of Betancourt around, uh-huh. you know, would be pretty good, uh, pretty good for the group. Uh-huh. Yeah. It- he fits that veteran leader in a bullpen that's actually effective and, and is good at what he does. Now, like you said, just unfortunately, like Tommy John elbow injuries and stuff acted up on him and just kind of sapped him the rest of the way. Took out maybe don't, you didn't need to bring him back after the injury, but they tried their best. And Hey, at least he was back out there and tossed 45 games in 2015. Just, couldn't get it done just struggled so much but still had 40 strikeouts that year against 12 walks in 40 innings so through strikes <laughs> that's what you need man look at looking at oh man you know Jalice Chassin those you know at the end of his career I look at those it just it's crazy to remember how bad those teams were yeah the, the you know that 2012 team, the four man rotation. Oh man! But we, it was just it was just crazy looking at who was on the field at that time. Yikes! <laughs> you know, there's, yeah. Uh, no wonder, no wonder things didn't go good. <laughs> Injuries decimated that team, and then it was just bad across the board. We're like, yeah, Tyler Colvin was good. Jordan Pacheco had a good year. DJ LeMayhew was starting to come onto the scene. Tulo got injured, though. And Eric Young Jr., like we talked about, but he had a good year. Charlie Blackman was showing glimpses, but he got injured. He had the GM but, Bino off the bench. But we had Jamie Moyer. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie Moyer made the opening day roster. Oh, man. Sheesh. But Rafael Bedcourt was something, one of the positives on that. And like I said, he, he was, I think for me, if we're, if we're building an all time Rockies lineup, I am putting Rafael Bedcourt in my bullpen mm-hmm. because he, he, like I said, very successful as a setup guy, didn't walk people and you know, he had that success as a closer. And so when I'm, when I'm putting together a bullpen, I'm putting Betancourt in there mm-hmm. as a guy that I want, because and I wish he was around to teach the, the bullpen now 
in, in 2024. Mm-hmm. Get in and throw strikes. Get to O2 and don't waste four pitches. Yeah. Get after the guy and put him away. The Rockies have always had solid defense and work to it. Sadly, you know, and Bencourt wasn't a strikeout pitcher. No. But he would if you're around the zone and locating, you don't have to blow it past guys. Mm-hmm. You know, getting weak contact. He had that slurve. Cause it wasn't it wasn't so much a slider, wasn't so much a curveball, and a lot of weak contact. And that's you know that you see guys like him, there's a recipe for success. Mm-hmm. You know, study it. Look at how he attacked hitters. Look at how he the pitch mix, the the locations. You know, that's what that's what they need to do, but yeah. Rafael Betancourt, he's on my list. Yeah. And uh, we'll play with old rules so he doesn't have to worry about the pitch clock. Though, yeah. apparently, if if this research is correct, there was the rule to avoid unnecessary delays that if a pitcher takes at least 12 seconds to deliver a pitch, the pitch is automatically ruled the ball. Betancourt was one of the few pitchers who have had this rule enforced while pitching. So... The pitch clock type rule existed. There's just a clock on the field now to show it. <laughs> yeah. That it will always be in force. Uh, there's probably some discretion back in the day, but dude took forever. <laughs> but at least he was effective. So it at least made up for it. Yeah. <laughs> but that's all Rafi Betancourt, one of the best. And so we move on now to our final one here. This one's a little bit more Dustin speed of a guy in Jose Jimenez, who was a pretty effective reliever for the Rockies. You know, and he's one that I'd always do in the baseball name game. He'd always be one of my dudes to hit him with the double, the double initials. Mm-hmm. But Jose Jimenez, uh, the right-handed pitcher, out of La República Dominicana. And he was uh, brought up in the St. Louis Cardinals system, made his major league debut in 1998, and he jumped onto the scene for something pretty special in 1999 when he throws a no-hitter as a true rookie. And... It was it was crazy. It was a one nothing. Uh, it said in in 1999 with the Cardinals, he pitched a no hitter in the first of two consecutive starts, defeating Arizona Diamondbacks and future Hall of Famer Randy Johnson. One nothing complete game shutouts. Mm-hmm. So so that's where he jumped onto the scene. I remember that and think, dang, this kid's pretty legit a no hitter as a as a as a rookie against the powerhouse of the diamondbacks at that time mm-hmm. against randy johnson the future hall of famer you know looked legit but he only he was only in st louis for those two you know season in a little bit and then he came over to the rockies in 1999 november 1999 the the cardinals traded this is a big. This is a big trade at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, traded by St. Louis with Manny Avar, Brent Butler, and Rick Crushore to the Rockies for Luther Hackman, Daryl Kyle, and Dave Veers. You know, this was a this was a big time deal. Uh, the Rockies dumping off Daryl Kyle's contract and him, Dave Veers, solid reliever. Luther Hackman was another guy that. You know, they, they throw him over and got, you know, I think Jose Jimenez was a bright spot in that trade. Uh, but immediately with the Rockies, they put him into relief. Uh, played for the Rockies. Uh, played for the Rockies until, you know, through the 2003 season. And then he was granted um, free agency, signed with the with Cleveland uh, for a year and then 
signed with the Arizona Diamondbacks. But, you know, he was – he played two games for Cleveland in 2004, and that was – that was it. Never made it with the – well, I guess – sorry. With Cleveland, he played in 31 games for that season. But after that, he was he was done and out of baseball. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a little – little blip all things considered for his career but that little prime years with the rockies really solid reliever uh probably wasn't setting the world on fire no definitely had his own struggles uh on the mound but still was going in there and settled in as the closer to getting saves which what a weird transition to go from throwing a no hitter as a starter in 1999 163 innings and now I'm a closer. <laughs> Just the that whiplash transition and did it well in 2000. 3.18 ERA in 72 games with 24 saves over 70 and two thirds innings. Not too shabby. You know, in the yeah, in those three seasons, 102 saves. For at the time, he became the all time leader in saves. He set the franchise record. Franchise record of his time at 41 saves in 2002. And, you know, they, uh, what was it, in 2003, then things just got weird. You know, he, he ended up making three, he made seven starts, but he had 20 saves. And his his ERA just ballooned up after that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, it was, it was crazy, but dang, in that, you know, those, those four years, you know, 24 saves, 17 saves, 41, and then 20, you know, his ERA just, he had a 318, 409, five, or a 356, 522. So I think that last year is because he, jumped into the starter role and uh-huh. in uh, this thing, but it was, he was never, he wasn't a strikeout guy. He, mm-hmm. And again, I bet he could have had a lot more success if he would have just thrown more strikes. Yeah. Cause he, he did throw a lot of balls, you know, uh-huh. a ton of walks, but somehow even in those years, picked up, you know, that 102 saves. Pretty legit, and a lot of people forget about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the walks were the big thing for him in those years with Colorado. Had a uh, 7.1% walk rate, which it's not terrible, but it's also not great. Still kind of below league averages. But he a thirteen point two percent strikeout rate, which is good bit below the the averages at the time. And opponents hit two seventy nine against him, um, so just a lot of walks and strikeout, not a lot of strikeouts, but made up for it with ground balls. Fifty three point five percent ground ball rate with the Rockies, so he was getting it done. You can work around the walks if you're getting if you can get the ground balls, which you regularly do. So. It's possible to survive with a lot of walks, but probably not. It's still not best. You're playing with fire there. (laughs) Yeah, but but Jose Jimenez, and he wasn't a he wasn't a fireballer. Mm -hmm. Like, and sadly, his career kind of ended on a very sour note. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, he 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 ended up being released from the from the Indians after he just did not do very well. Later on, 2007 for the Pan American Games, boom, caught with uh, tested positive for banned substance, anabolic steroids, and that was kind of, that was it. That was the final, all right, mm-hmm. you're done with baseball. But in that, in that small stretch for the Rockies a lot of success as a closer Mm -hmm. yeah those career saves 
end up with 102. That plays him second all time. Uh, held that held the top spot until Brian Fuentes overtook him with that 115. Yeah, he's right there, number two all time in saves. Largely in part thanks to that 41 save season that just rocketed him up there because uh, he doesn't necessarily uh, in that win probability added rankings. I'm still scrolling and I haven't seen him among these top 50. So weird stuff. He's probably on here, but I'm just not seeing him right now. No, oh, well, yeah, yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't appear on this list. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I saw it. One of those flash in the pan type of closers where, yeah, he was good, had some solid years, and then it just stopped, and he struggled, and then kind of ended his career. And that happens to a lot of closers and relievers where. Relievers are so volatile. It's a year to year. They can be excellent one year and then just really struggles the next year. Maybe they bounce back. A lot of times they don't sometimes. And so they're a weird breed of of pitcher that you have in baseball these days. Being a reliever is a really weird job. One of the tough ones in baseball. And it's tough to be really successful at it. No, and these three guys found success at times. Jose Jimenez had some excellent years, but it, those walks, you just see those walk numbers, you're like, ugh. Yeah. Throw strikes. What could have been if you had just learned how to throw more strikes? Yeah. But like we said, this these were three guys that had these, you know, three to four year stints that, you know, decent, put them up on the leaderboards of, of saves. And, and then they were gone. And again, we still, the Rockies just year after year continue to struggle with getting a guy that the manager can plug in. We have a lead. We're going to get it done in the ninth, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and hopefully one of these years (laughs) it'll fall back in and we'll get a guy that, can stick out because even right now the last few years it's when we had you know brian fuentes was a a staple there for again three seasons ish manny corpus for two maybe a year and a half and then it's been just a continual you know a rotating door uh greg holland that will we we were going to cover but we picked these guys. Uh, we've, we've talked about um, Wade Davis. Wade, da- Wade Davis. And then we really haven't had anything else. Yeah. You know, it's Daniel Bard, but he's been hurt. And then, you know, there was these Rex guys. Brothers. Just, Rex Brothers. Yeah, Rex Brothers. Adam Adovino that we've, we've tried Justin Lawrence tried and everybody thought this was the year and nothing. Uh, you know, they shipped off, they let him, they let, uh, there's Pierce oh. Johnson. <laughs> oh. And who was he? The wild thing. Carlos he, Estevez, Carlos Estevez that went on to the, to the angels and did pretty well last year for him. You know, at that, at that role, but, Hopefully the Rockies one day will figure out this closer role and get a guy that will just shut the door. Yeah. So we're not blowing nine run leads in the ninth inning. Yeah. <laughs> Cause, cause closers these days, they'll never pay for a premium closer like a Josh Hader or, you know, Edwin Diaz. Because like I said, relievers are really volatile. So it's, if you can get three, maybe four years out of a guy as a closer, you'll take that. Because the days of a Mariano Rivera or a Trevor Hoffman, those days are done. Oh, Nobody yeah. Reaching those heights as a closer ever again. And But uh, if you can get three, maybe four years solid out of a guy, you'll take that. And then it's just figuring out that recipe of, okay, what made him successful? How can we repeat that? Oh, how can we foster a guy in the minor leagues to get him to that point? Because there's a different mentality when you're coming up just as a reliever and coming up as a closer 
type of guy. And maybe that's what the Rockets have to do is find a guy, pinpoint him. <laughs> it's hard to draft him because you're usually going for starters. But pinpointing a guy of like, we want you to be a closer. Here we go. And just foster him up through the system like that. Maybe that's how you have to do it. I don't know, but you need a closer. So, yeah, something like that. And then, you know, coming up the pipeline, we really, you think of, you know, who is there at AAA? I don't see a closer guy there. Hartford? Jaden Hill is probably the only one that I can think of. There's a couple maybe. other guys, maybe, like a Zach Agnos or a couple yeah, other that's, guys. But he's you, the one that I think of, you know, because he did it at, in Fresno and he's doing it at Spokane. But, you know, it's it's hard. And we just, I think at the bottom line, we need guys that will go in and throw strikes. Yeah. Throw strikes, full hitters. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Learn how to miss some bats. And I think Victor Vodnik right now is the guy that could be, you know, that next type of closer because he's the best reliever they've got this year and he can throw some gas. And so hopefully he can get some more opportunities and he could, you know, fit in with one of these guys. These guys were all kind of soft tossers, you know, in, in the sense of the word. But the closers today are throwing heat. That's what you want of your closers. A guy could come in and throw some gas. Victor Vodnik fits that mold. and But it, at the end of the day, like we're saying, you got to throw strikes and get outs. And Street did it. Betancourt could do it. Jose Jimenez could do it, if he, <laughs> but not as well as the other two. Do it when he needed to. But those other two... They were so successful because they could throw strikes and get outs. And like you said with Betancourt, he wasn't a strikeout pitcher, but strikeouts were just a natural result of him pounding the zone and and fooling guys, locating mm-hmm. his pitches. Fastball, fastball, slider away, boom, they're they're gone. Or it's or it's the pitching backwards. Yeah. Boom, you hit a guy with the, the breaking ball first pitch, and then they don't know what's coming. And he paints two on the outside. Two mm-hmm. fastballs. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm, I'm just here looking. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully it's a it's a problem that the Rockies can figure out. But we have plenty of closers we can talk about on another episode on future episodes. Still some other guys that had some success and other general relievers as well who were who were solid in a Rockies uniform. But that'll do it here for this edition of Every Rocky Ever. We appreciate you tuning in. And you can follow us at every Rocky ever over on Twitter. You can follow at Rocky mountain rooftop. That's R O C K Y M T N rooftop over on Twitter. And be sure to like, and subscribe over on YouTube for the video version. And also follow along your favorite podcasting platforms. And Hey, go ahead and leave us a five-star review. If you'd like to nothing less than three is what I always say. (laughs) So some of that love though. But we always appreciate you tuning in. You can find me at sideline underscore crowd, writing for purpleroad.com and fans for sportsnetwork.com. You can follow Dustin at Mr. T Spanish. Missed anything? I think we're good. Nope. I think we're good. But that'll do it here. Thank you always for tuning in. Until next time, I'm Skyler. That's Dustin. Farewell. Farewell. <laughs>